Okay, thank you. I'm a professor in civil and environmental engineering, uh, background in chemical engineering, uh, and I think a lot about water. Uh, this uh, Friday I'll be giving a talk at homecoming weekend, and so I thought maybe I could try this talk out on you all and see how it might play in Coverly Auditorium at 3.30 on Friday. So the title of this uh, talk is uh, Got Water? You know, that's like the milk mustache thing, you know. Uh, and the theme is urban water supplies in the arid west. And the subject that I'll be discussing is informed by that paper that I sent earlier and by our group of researchers, faculty, graduate students, postdocs, and others that are participating in a NSF Engineering Research Center, of which I'm the director. And the title of that center is Reinventing the Nation's Urban Water Infrastructure. The center comprises uh, Stanford, Berkeley, Colorado School of Mines, and New Mexico State. So when I go through here, I'll, I'll show examples that um, relate to the work in our center. And I don't claim to, you know, I'm not the person who does all this, but obviously I'm, I'm involved. Uh, so what is it that we think about in terms of urban water uh, and in the West? Uh, one is that we have a population increase. If we were in Wisconsin or somewhere, there might be population decrease or some parts of the Midwest. We have people moving to what you might call the dry sun belt. We also have climate change. And up through uh, uh, July of this year, it was the driest year on record, on record in um, much of the West. And we see that climate change will mean it will be hotter and drier and our precipitation will come uh, more as rain than snow. And that, that presents challenges for us. Like all of our nation's infrastructure, there's gap in maintaining it. And with our water infrastructure, most of it is between 50 and 100 years old. So one way or another, it's at the end of its service life. So there are going to be lots of investments in urban water infrastructure. And what we can do now is look at the current system as it needs to meet these challenges and think about are there new ways of doing business? And can we do something different in the future to save money, save water, and save energy? And part of the vision for the future is we want to rely on less imported water. And also we recognize there's new water contaminants that we have to pay attention to as well. So how is it that we address all of these challenges then? The way we think about it is um, maybe we could work in four areas. Uh, one is increasing water availability. That would mean like thinking, for example, of more water reuse uh, or maybe storm water as a source of our drinking water supply. Another one is in, uh, broadening our treatment options. And I show here a picture of a wetland uh, doing new kinds of treatment and looking at the role that natural systems might play as part of our physical infrastructure. A third is uh, considering wastewater not as a waste but as a resource uh, for energy. And, uh, and certain nutrients. And then this one, uh, which is important, uh, is sort of the systems level thinking and integration. We're dealing with public infrastructure and public systems. So naturally, there's a planning, social, political, and economic process that takes place uh, in, in the area in which we work. And we have to be able to address those institutional issues or nothing will change. In other words, uh, we could have students doing the very best work in these three boxes, but if we don't understand how things are integrate at the systems level and how to address those uh, scale-up issues, the regulatory issues, the planning issues, and life cycle analysis, uh, then we're just stuck. Uh, and what I mean by stuck is we'll have published papers and students like Hannah will graduate, but we won't have an impact. So let's look at some examples here. And I'm going to just show you uh, examples from uh, a few examples from California um, and then one from Colorado. So this is a picture of uh, 
where we get our water from in Santa Clara Valley. It's a pie chart, and uh, obviously. And uh, the pie chart shows where we are today. There's a, a lot of imported water here. This uh, Central Valley is imported water. It's pumped in. State Water Project is pumped in. And there's a little wedge up there called recycling. Now, the goal is to more than double the amount of water that we're recycling in the next 10 years. In other words, uh, that wedge is going to get bigger. So how well are we doing at that? And there's a picture here that sh shows the current situation. Uh, the wastewater for San Jose, Milpitas, Santa Clara goes down to one base big wastewater treatment plant. It's off 237, it's the south end of the bay. And if you, when you fly into SFO, you kind of turn, and if you look out the window, you can see this, this big plant. Well, it does a very good job of, uh, of treating wastewater. And so water flows downhill to the centralized facility. Then it goes a through a few additional steps, and then it's, uh, it's recycled. And it's redistributed through these kinds of systems here. That's a pipe, and it's got a characteristic color, purple. And that identifies it as recycled water. And that's uh, it's just what's done for code. All right, so we have this centralized facility and pumping back to the cities, and that water can go around in a loop. The thing that's interesting about this is when we look at these um, energy that's required to deliver this water, there's a lot of benefits that come from recycling water. So there are a number of little bars here, but the one I want to point to are the ones with these uh, red arrows. This is the energy content, and you can forget about the units here, but uh, just look at the height of that bar. That's the current water supply for uh, uh, Santa Clara Valley. This much of it, this big green part, that's the pumping of the water to the system from the uh, state water project uh, and the like. If we go to recycled water, we can, we're, we're not paying for that big import fee, uh, that energy fee, I guess. Uh, and we reduce the energy content by about half. So this is a good idea. Uh, but, but even here, uh, there's a fair amount of uh, energy that's required to distribute that water in the system. So how's this system looking today then? Um, there's a little bit of a problem. When you have the centralized facility at the edge of the bay, you have these big sewer interceptors all coming down to the treatment plant. And we're talking about big flows here, like 100 a million gallons a day or so. Uh, you have this big flow coming down to the treatment plant with these sewers, and the sewers will tend to infiltrate a bit. In other words, water tend to leak in. And that water is a little bit brackish because you're near the edge of the bay. The end result is because of the salt content on the imported water and the salt that leaks in, the water is a little bit too salty to expand the um, reuse of that water. So what the city has built is a 10 million gallon a day facility to try out uh, ways to remove those salts. Now, just think of sodium chloride. We're not talking big contaminants here, just simple salts. The additional steps are a series of nanofiltration, reverse osmosis, and UV disinfection. Basically, when we're all done with that, we produce something that's essentially drinking water. And the idea here now is we re-blend that in that uh, recycled water, you have something like distilled water with the salty water. You, you mix the two together and average it out, and you get the salt content that you want. So um, even with this treatment, this is still less uh, than imported water, even though you have to provide this extra energy here. Um, so that's the situation today. But the question is, is can we do better than that? And the answer is, um, well, if we had to redesign the system, we might rethink the idea of these centralized plants. So that star up there is the central plant. And these, um, these lines here are that 130 miles of that distribution system, the reverse plumbing system. 
Um, now, what's expensive here is putting in those purple pipes. If you have to dig up streets in a city, you're on the order about $2 million a mile or so to put that, those pipes in place. Also, in this case, uh, you're basically taking water from where it was used and generating it, letting it flow all downhill, treating it to a high degree, and then pumping it all back uphill. So one, one vision of rethinking our systems here was that maybe we should imagine our future um, water supply and wastewater systems being more distributed than centralized. And how might this work? Um, well, this would be an example of what you might call a, a, a sewer shed, kind of like a tree, where um, different communities are sending water to a centralized facility. And let's imagine this box up there in the up right corner is Stanford campus. We could imagine building a wastewater uh, reclamation facility right here on the Stanford campus over by, uh, well, behind the credit union, if you know where that is, off Bon Air siding, where all the dump trucks are. Uh, demonstrate how we could reclaim water that would be suitable for irrigation on the Stanford campus. Demonstrate how this can be done with energy recovery, so it's energy neutral or maybe energy positive. And from a pilot experiment, or that something that would be on the scale of maybe 10 or 20 gallons a minute, then we could use that as a test bed to say, would this vision really be realized? Could we actually expand this out and treat the million gallons a day of wastewater that comes from the Stanford campus? So the idea here is this kind of a system would provide several benefits. Uh, not only does it uh, um, um, allow us to meet our future water supply needs on the Stanford campus, but we would also have a system that we're recovering energy and we're being able to do this water recycle in a much more efficient mode. And this is what we have um, in, in planning to actually demonstrate on the Stanford campus over there at a, at a pilot facility uh, that's, that's in design right now to test out technologies that would allow us to achieve this vision. When we look at Stanford, it's sort of obvious in a way that maybe we would make a good sub-area for study or for trial because we're, you know, we're kind of self-contained. And all the sewers on campus go to one place, and that would be the place you'd want to tap in. But when we look at the problem here, uh, this, is just, this is the sewer shed for the Palo Alto uh, water quality control plant. And when you begin to think, well, how is this really going to work in practice, you end up with lots of issues to discuss here that are like, well, what's the spatial configuration? What's the topography? Oh, what's the hydraulic models? What's the flow and mass balance? What kind of systems would you put in a satellite treatment plant? Uh, you have all kinds of technologies to choose from. Would you do energy recovery or not? What's the resilience of the system? Well. You, you could ask, you could put more issues here, but you can see right away how you'll get so many com combinations and permutations that if you really want to think this out, it becomes a complicated problem. And we've been using uh, uh, decision analytic tools coupled to uh, technology modules to address the issue of, well, what would be the right vision for, for this system? And the vision would be a couple of satellite plants and still the centralized facility, though doing something a little bit different in the future. So thinking through this then, how, the, how does that vision of that satellite treatment plant work? It's kind of tricky to say where, where exactly and, and how. And so this was our first test case at that. Uh, the other thing is, is when we look at these purple pipe systems, we're producing here uh, typically one water quality all the time. And we can do better than that. You'd think maybe I should be able to produce waters of different quality depending on what its uh, intended use is. And we can, for inspiration on this, we can look down at a, a treatment facility that's south of the um, Los Angeles International Airport. Uh, 
and at West Basin, this is, if you go south of the LA airport, there's a big industrial area uh, kind of along the coast there. It's petroleum refineries and whatnot. But what they do there at that treatment plant is they produce waters of five different qualities, uh, depending on if it's using for cooling, potable reuse, uh, uh, irrigation, and whatnot. Uh, so it's possible to do this, uh, but it's not possible to extend this vision very far from what it is now today because they've already um, exploited their customer base right there in that small district where all those, uh, in that sort of industrial area of LA. So we were thinking in the center here then, well, how do we produce waters of different quality? And what quality might we like? And this is a system that's being tested at uh, Colorado School of Mines. It's basically um, a combination of membrane reactors and biological treatment systems that can produce waters largely of two quality. That's safe to come in contact with, but one, if you operate the system one way, you leave nitrogen and phosphorus in the water. If you operate another way, you take it out. Now, what's, what's about nitrogen and phosphorus? Well, these are nutrients. So if you're using water for irrigation, as you would in the summer, you might want to operate this plant to lead the nutrients in because it'll supply a little bit of the nitrogen and phosphorus. But in the wintertime, when the ground's frozen, uh, this water would go to a stream and you don't want to over-fertilize streams and rivers. So you take the, take the nutrients out. Well, this idea of being able to switch back and forth between waters of two qualities, nutrient-rich or nutrient-poor, is an example of, uh, of tailored water and has a, this, this, that switch right there is one that has a lot of implications to expand water reuse. The other one is uh, I mentioned in that, in that box of sort of four themes uh, was the one of wastewater as a resource. Wastewater contains organic matter. It contains nitrogen as well, ammonia. And what we do today is we expend energy to treat that wastewater. But the wastewater itself, if you look at the chemical energy that's in there in terms of reduced carbon and reduced nitrogen, it has more than enough chemical potential energy to treat itself. But how do we do that? Well, we have to go to a new kinds of systems. We need to go to anaerobic technologies, that is technologies that don't involve aeration, and capture all of this carbon as methane. And then we can combust the methane, produce electricity, and these plants can become energy positive. And that's a different mode of operation. But to take a big plant like East Bay Municipal Utility District and say, all right, let's get rid of all your aeration basins. We're going to go to this new idea. Well, we have to test these out at scale, at some scale. And again, this is something we could test out at the Stanford uh, modules that we would place over on the uh, other corner of campus. Another thing that's interesting here is to think about wastewater treatment plants of the future as resource recovery facilities. Um, my folks moved to Palo Alto in December of 56. And at that time, in the summer, in August, the baylands would stink like n you can't imagine the stink. And where was it coming from? It was coming from San Jose and from all the canning operations that were done down in San Jose. Now there are no canneries left there anymore. Uh, so with the canneries, the canning facilities moving away and the upgrade in the treatment plants, we weren't discharging this waste to the bay. There used to be canneries in Oakland, too, but they're not there anymore. But the plant was designed when they were expecting a lot of you know, um, food processing waste to come to the plants. So in Oakland, they happen to have excess capacity in these systems here that are called digesters. So what, what um, they've done at East Bay Municipal Utility District is to rethink one part of their operations. And that's this part that deals with all the waste sludges and have instituted a program to bring in trucked food waste from Napa and the Central Valley, like chicken blood or whatever, 
and then process through these digesters and convert that carbonaceous material to methane and then combust that and that's a successful program and now East Bay Municipal Utility District's plant uh, is really the first um, energy positive plant, wastewater treatment plant in the country. And they're able to do this because of the trucked waste program. So for us in our center here, what we're studying are these uh, anaerobic technologies, how they'll really work. And then also the business model of the trucked waste. I mean, what if Napa decides, you know, this looks like a good deal. Why don't we, instead of having the trucks run down to Oakland, why don't we, why don't we do this ourselves? Or what if uh, Modesto decides, you know, this is a great idea. We can just do that too. How many of these facilities could you support around the Bay? Well, those are the kinds of um, uh, sort of systems level questions that, that come to mind about expanding this. Now, so there's sort of a business finance issues here, and there are these technological issues about how you really make these plants work reliably. Um, the other box that I mentioned at the start of the talk was uh, broadening the treatment options. And here, um, we might think of how can we use natural systems to treat our water? And natural systems you can think of as wetlands or maybe these bioinfiltration basins like this. And you've all seen these along curbsides and the like. Um, well, we, we believe natural systems can improve our water quality. They can be a source of uh, local water for us. Obviously, they improve the urban aesthetics and they create habitat. So when we think about reuse and stormwater capture, and recharge of groundwater, there's a big role here for natural systems to play a role. These natural systems, I would think you all have seen wetlands and marshes and grassy areas, and you think, gee, that's, there's appeal. Do you like the wildlife habitat, the purification, the low energy, the green? But, you know, engineers look at this, and maybe plant operators look at these and say, you know, these natural systems are unpredictable. They may be inefficient if it gets cold. There's some seasonal variability. I really don't know how to manage to optimize or change performance. So these are issues that we're addressing in our center, is how can we better invoke natural systems as part of our urban water infrastructure? Now, where might this go? Well, let's look at the issue of stormwater capture. You all know stormwater. You know what happens around here with all our stormwater. We just collect it up and push it to the bay as fast as we can. And you, you know all the curbs that say, you know, don't throw the waste here, flows to bay. So all along, all the big cities, you know, kind of like from, well, the California coast here, the, the, the mentality was uh, quickly collect that stormwater and shove it to the ocean or bay and get rid of it. Now we see it as a resource for the future. So this is a, uh, another pie chart. The last pie chart I'll show is uh, where the city of LA sees them getting their water for the future. This is where they are today, and that's where they want to go tomorrow. And uh, there are, so there are two pie charts, but this doesn't look like much of a pie chart because there's one big, huge piece here. And this is the piece that's water imported from Northern California in the Colorado River. And the plan for the future, 20 years out, is even with increase in population, the absolute amount of water that they're going to import is going to be less. And this is a trend for the future. L less reliance on imported water. And so how do you make up this difference? Well, recycled water plays a big role, and stormwater capture now plays a big role. I mean, it was, stormwater wasn't even on the on the on this side of the picture. So how does stormwater capture really work? How would it work in LA? Well, um, it, we live in a Mediterranean climate. And what does that mean? That means we get these heavy rainstorms in the winter, and then it doesn't rain for six months or something like that or whatever. You know, we're still in our dry season. So we have a challenge here of sort of balancing out the time when we have water and the time when we need it. Our approach to these flashy storms was to build these things that you see in Hollywood movies, you know, the chase scenes in Terminator or something. 
Uh, and then another problem here is that you get these big surges that kind of flush the city and you end up with contaminated beaches. And there's some parts of the city uh, north of the Burbank Airport that don't even have storm sewers. So that's where we are here. So we say, well, how can we think of a, of a new way of sort of managing this flashy systems, manage the localized flooding, save this water before it goes to the ocean, and at the same time prevent the pollution of beaches. Now that's the idea. Well, how big would these systems have to be to make a difference? Well, this shows the cost per acre foot of water captured versus the acre feet captured. In other words, you say uh, cost per gallon uh, versus number of gallons. And an acre foot is about a third of a million gallons. The point here is you can uh, see how this, this is, these are both log scales. So to be efficient here, we need a big system. We need something that will capture about 1,000 acre feet a year. And that becomes an efficient size. Well, um, where, where might we try this out? And we're working with the city of Los Angeles, uh, well, the LA Department of Water and Power and the Bureau of Sanitation and uh, Public Works to look at a, a field site north of the Burbank Airport, which is a current uh, old gravel pit and a little bit of a dump for construction debris. And converting that to a system that would collect storm water, hold it for a while, then process it through this wetland, and thereby purify the water. We might have to put a few more steps here and then pump it about that far into the ground and becomes part of the uh, water supply for the city of Los Angeles. Now that's the picture. This is, this is the artist's picture. I have other ones that make this look like it's just this little isolated thing out in the green space, you know. The reality is, though, this is the area in which it sits. Uh, a lot of automobile recycling and, and industrial activity just, just off the edge of the picture here. So when we think about stormwater capture, we need, a, we need a big spot. And you can repurpose some of these sorts of places. But you also need to be aware that stormwater is not clean, obviously. It contains uh, biocides. Uh, you know, that are used for weed control and that kind of things. Uh, it has uh, vehicle-related contaminants, uh, oils and stuff like that, additives to tires, uh, ingredients in antifreeze. All of this is, is in our storm water. So the challenge for us then is to think about how do these, how might that wetland system really work in removing those, those kinds of contaminants? And these are not, those, those ones I just had on the previous slide are not the normal thing you find in wastewater. This is stormwater. And so what we're looking at here is a combination of both uh, uh, natural systems, like a cell here that would be open, and uh, a system like this that might have um, an infiltration system with different uh, media to remove the last little bit of contaminants. Um, so the idea is that we are imagining that we can do a better job of, of designing and operating these wetland systems. And here I show a picture of a, of a wetland system that really doesn't have any plants in it, uh, at least emergent plants. It's a very shallow system, about a foot and a half deep. And the idea here is to, pr is to promote uh, um, reaction with sunlight. That's called photolysis. And then in this system, you'd be growing a little bit of algae, and there'd be some bacteria there. So there's a combination of uh, physiochemical transformation here by reaction with sunlight, and then bacterial reactions here in this, in this bottom little uh, layer that would form in that cell. And we've, we've tested these ideas out at that picture I just showed earlier at uh, at this small plant up here in Discovery Bay. Uh, but there are all questions about how does this really scale up? 
and will it be reliable at big scale? And for that, we are working with Orange County Water District, and they have just built for our testing um, a set of three parallel cells that are 100 feet wide each and 800 feet long. And so this is a, this is, I guess you'd almost, I call this a full scale system. Um, but we have these three parallel trains here, or we could make it be serpentine back and forth. That system is built, um, and our experimentation will begin later this year on addressing questions of both uh, a sort of a biogeochemical nature and a control, how, how do we actually sense and control these facilities. So um, I guess I go a little bit off script here a little bit. You know, this shows the value that this water district has placed in our in our ideas here when you look at um, when you look at this I have another picture that maybe I should use that on Friday it shows a truck out there and you can't see the truck I mean you can tell this is a dump truck and this thing is huge uh, so anyway this is right by the Santa Ana River and uh, and this will be our experimental facility to look at uh, at how to upscale uh, these, uh, these new ideas in uh, uh, wetland treatment systems. Another area in which we're working is out near Denver, um, sort of um, northwest of the Denver airport. This is the South Platte River that flows out of Denver. And the South Platte River in the summertime, much of the year, is basically wastewater from Denver. I mean, it's been treated, but it's what's referred to as an effluent-dominated river. Uh, with some water transactions, uh, there was an opportunity for the city of Aurora to take some of this water and pump it to meet their water needs. And what they've set up here, and what we've studied and investigated over the last several years, is the, how this system works in terms of this pumping of the water from the river. Now, you don't pump it from the river directly, you pump it from this well that's adjacent to the river. So you get a little bit, it's called bank filtration. You get a little bit of filtration to the earth here. That water then goes into this recharge basin, stays in there for a while and is pumped out, and then goes to the city. So it's a combination of a bank filtration and this recharge basin. And this leads to a new idea that we've been able to show about how different reactions are occurring in each parts of the system to remove contaminants. Um, when you pump the water through the ground or into the ground and then you're going to pump it out again, it comes with a little bit of contaminants. Um, they're more degradable. They deplete the oxygen in the water. So in this first step here, you get a consortium of microbes that can live on sort of the easily degraded substances that are in that water. And then they begin to deplete the oxygen. You pump that over into this system. There's a picture of the Aurora Recharge Basin. You pump it over here, and you get a different floor of microbes. And what happens there now is uh, the easily degraded carbon is gone. Uh, it's an oxic system, and you get a whole different floor of microbes. Uh, the two together really remove the trace contaminants with a high degree of efficiency. So we call this managed aquifer recharge, or because we're at Stanford, I guess we like to put an I before everything. I might call it I-M-A-R. But that's a, this understanding these, these working together, these two systems, um, has led to better understanding of how we can recharge groundwater in ways in which it can become part of our urban water supply, but do it in ways that are safely, or that are safe. And then lastly, uh, the last box I talked about was the one of establishing the enabling environment, meaning how do you do systems level thinking? Uh, you know, what's the, why should I do stormwater versus water recycle? Or why do I need to do either of those? Can I just buy someone else's water? You know, say, when you think about your urban water supply. Well, for this, there's no straight answer. There's no one answer for every place. There are clearly uh, 
regional and political realities and the solutions that come up in one place are not the same for another place. But within one region, I think we can understand that um, working, to, working together collectively can provide local benefits. With that thought, uh, this is a picture of uh, Sonoma County. And we're working with Sonoma County Water Agency to look at the idea of stormwater capture for them. Now, they've gone through a whole lot of review with their citizens in Sonoma and have said, and, and through a bunch of public meetings and presentations, I guess, like this, they get informed about the future of their water supply. What do you people want? What do the public want? And there were two things, flood prevention and stormwater capture for reuse. Now, this comes from a you know, sort of large decision analysis, but down to those two things, flood prevention and stormwater reuse. So what's our contribution here? Well, we're going to be looking again at some contaminant removal in those systems. But another big picture idea is where exactly would you put these capture systems? Where do they fit in terms of an urban planning context? What does it mean to repurpose some land? Would the community accept that? Um, how many times could you replicate it? How many sites could there be that you would work at? So for this, this takes us into the realm of urban planning and design. We, meaning folks like me and my colleagues, can come up with these systems that remove contaminants and collect the water. Now you say, well, where do I place them out here? Well, you can imagine that's a whole different set of questions. Another issue in the Bay Area that we're facing this is the last example, is uh, the role of nitrogen uh, in, in San Francisco Bay. Nitrogen's in wastewater. It's a, uh, the, and the nitrogen in wastewater is really no different than the nitrogen in fertilizer. You put fertilizer on the ground and the grass grows. You put fertilizer in the bay, and then what happens? Who said that? You did. Algae. Today, yes. Some years ago, no. Because the bay was more turbid. So you remember, for algae needs nutrients and needs sunlight. When the bay was more turbid, this nitrogen discharge was not, there were controls on nitrogen, but it wasn't such a big issue. Now with the bay becoming clearer because of less silt input from the old mining activities a long time ago, and invasive clams that sit at the bottom of the bay and act as filter feeders, the water's getting clearer. So we now are facing a um, issue about nitrogen removal from all these wastewaters. This, and then how might you do this? Well, man, this is a uh, billion dollar pro All the problems here are, are B, pro billion dollar problems. You have a bunch of wastewater dischargers that now think, oh gosh, I gotta do nitrogen removal. Before it was, don't discharge ammonia because that's toxic to fish. But you can convert the ammonia to something else. Well, how might you do this? Would you go up here in the north end of the bay, stormwater is a big deal, and the south end of the bay, it's wastewater treatment plants. What, what system might you look at to say, how am I gonna deal with this? And one area that we're looking at is to go back and revisit this wetland treatment system again. And we're working with uh, um, Oro Loma, which is over by, you know, just north of Union City, and are talking about a, a way in which we could take their wastewater, put it in a dike system, and that wastewater, you know, which is basically clean but has nitrate in it, would flow through the subsurface. And in this process here, the nitrate's taken out and the water steeps to the bay. Now, what's special here? Well, this is a low energy system. You're building up a dike here that gives you some flood protection. This might work 50, 60 years, something like that. It creates a habitat where there isn't now. And there's also recreational benefits that can occur, you know, with bicycle paths around this kind of facility. And you could imagine this uh, expanding perhaps around the south end of the bay. This piece here, this freshwater, this uh, brackish water 
ecosystem, this, this reach is largely gone on the fringe of the bay because of fill. All right. Last slide now is say, well, how do you, how do you put all this together? Do you like this or not? And how are you going to manage nitrogen? And this is where you all come in. You, you know, you say, let's look at a decision tree here. Or decision tree. I mean, you know, a little decision matrix. We can do various things as engineers. I could go optimize my plant. I'd get down there and tweak the daylights out of it so that it works the very best it can. I can also upgrade a plant, put more technology inside the plant fence. Or I might try this thing at Oral Loma that's being designed and built, use wetland systems. Or I might think of water reuse. If I reuse water, I'm not putting nitrogen nutrients back in the bay. Or I might think about source control uh, in various ways. And then you can look at this diagram and think, OK, uh, what's the cost? What's the risk of failure? And that's a huge thing in our field. You don't want to fail. What are the institutional barriers? What kind of co-benefits are there? Are there opportunities for additional funding beyond a wastewater treatment group? And would it be public support for those ideas? Well, what we're looking at in our center here is this idea that maybe we could solve this, help solve the problem by paying more attention to the role of wetlands and, and water reuse. At the end of the day, it's going to be a whole, all of these things are going to be, all of these will be done. But for us in our research, we think we can contribute here. And what I'd like to do is take some of these boxes that are orange or yellow and turn them green. And that's the role of our research. Um, the example would be, say, um, risk of failure uh, to show that, well, we can actually operate that system in Oral Loma reliably to remove nitrate, for example. And that box would go uh, from orange to yellow or maybe green in time. So to sum up then, um, what's the urban water of the, in the future going to look like? Um, for us in California in the arid west, well, these are, these are the big points here. More locally sourced water. Um, that means um, less imports, making do with the wastewater and recycle it, and capturing stormwater. Uh, but we'll think more about these decentralized systems as part of our infrastructure now. We see stormwater reuse. We look at systems that are, uh, in which we can recover energy, uh, wastewater treatment with resource recovery. Um, right now, when, we, when I showed you that picture of that San Jose plant, and I said it produces essentially uh, tap water, that really is tap water. But right now, it gets blended back into that recycled water. Probably what will happen in the future is, as we learn about that system and how it operates, There'll be something, there'll be another decision made. You know, maybe we should put that in a lake or in the ground because it's so good water. Why blend it with that uh, recycled water for irrigation? So there's some combination there between a direct or direct potable reuse. But we'll see more of that. And this integration of natural and engineered systems, all in the context of urban planning, social science, and systems, uh, a systems level view. So that's all I wanted to say. I'd be just happy to answer any questions now. We're all done. Yeah, yes, sir. Start with students, please. <clears throat> um, so I know that uh, among the different options that you, you sort of sh showed a bar graph of the energy intensity of different water sources, uh, um, desalination was sort of the most energy intensive option. But I know that it's being done in the Middle East and also in Australia um, pretty heavily. And there's a new plant going in or being proposed in San Diego. Do you see saltwater desalination as a, a viable option in the future or playing a big piece of the pie? The question was about uh, the desalination, its role in the future. It does have a role in the future, um, but it'll, it won't be the same everywhere. This, RO, this system I showed you for San Jose, that's, a, that's basically a desal system. Um, The situation in Israel and in much of the Middle East is there's really no other water around. 
So they're forced to look at the ocean. When I, I showed you the pie chart for Los Angeles, you remember all those little wedges there? You'll note that desal's not on not one of those wedges. There's water reuse, there's stormwater capture, but there's not ocean desal. And why is that? That's because the community in LA has decided that ocean water desalination for their water supply is too energy intensive, it's not sustainable, it produces a brine that might harm uh, the coastal ecosystem. So they've decided we're not gonna do it. And it wasn't on the pie chart. And that's a, kind of a good question to ask if we had more time is what's missing here on that one. San Diego, they're at the end of the pipeline, so to speak, on all this distribution system. And their, their options are less. So they're building this big ocean desal plant in Carlsbad, which is the largest uh, uh, seawater reclamation plant in the Western Hemisphere. Australia went through the millennium drought, 10 years of drought. And all the big cities there, Perth, Sydney, Adelaide, Melbourne, I'm missing one. There's five. Brisbane. All the big cities put in these desal plants. No sooner had those been built than I got some heavy rains. So what's happened in Australia now is because of the crisis, they said we need to build big desalination plants, but now they're not operating. So they're very intermittent, but you have to pay the capital costs. So this, to me, is a little lesson in what happens when you get into a crisis and about these big public investments. I'm not saying that desal is wrong. Perth needs it. They're, that's for them. Uh, but you might think, well, maybe we built these plants too big. We could have done something better with better systems management of our whole water supply. So in Australia, there's a little bit of head scratching then about we're paying a lot for those plants, but they're not running. So it's different. And I guess my own view here is that we don't have to work with seawater. You have salts and wastewater, you have brackish water. Um, work with that and the energy that's required to take the salts out is directly proportional to salt content. So that's why water reuse makes so much sense. Or water of impaired quality, think of it that way. Brackish water, that's say one third or one fifth seawater, something on that order. Oh, uh, yes? To improve the efficiency of these desal plants in terms of using less energy. Well, the, basically, there's been a whole lot of engineering tweaks over the years. Uh, and there were uh, advances in membrane technologies that reduced the pressure requirement across the membranes. And then there was big advancements in energy recovery. Basically, you have to pressurize water to a high degree to force it through these little thin membranes. And you end up with a reject stream that's more salty, but it's at high pressure. And through smart engineering, you say, well, I have high pressure water. I can run some turbines off of that. And so that energy recovery, has that, that played a big role in improving these energy efficiency of these desal plants. And maybe they're, how much is it? Three and a half, well, I, I, the units are just a little odd here, but it's. But there's, it sounds like there's been no high risk, high reward type research. In? In desal. Yes. It's been, uh, yeah, well, yes, that's right. It's been incremental. When they came to these very thin polyamide membranes, uh, that was a breakthrough. You know, I was 20 some years ago or 30 years ago. And the other one was in all these pumps. And when you have a high pressure stream, how to recapture the energy out of it. Yeah, basically it's the, we are, living with systems that we knew about, say, two decades, two decades ago, but have made them more energy efficient and more reliable. But it sounds like RBE has not had any real interest in this area. The what? RBE has not had any real interest in this area. RBE? RBE, right. Uh, RBE and, and Department of Energy. Oh, 
I'm sorry, I, did, I didn't understand what you're. Uh, not directly, you know. Um, we in our field look very much at, you know, the sort of that uh, energy that's in water. That's kind of our perspective, and that's an important wedge, but maybe a few percent. It was something that would show up on a pie chart, but it's a small wedge. The, the water required to make energy, now that's a different one. You know, that's where you have all the big cooling towers and you may have the frack water and that kind of stuff. So I think the DOE or ARPAE is more interested in the water to make energy. Ours is the energy in water. Right. And, and I mentioned the, the, the can do project in the flow competition. Yeah. Oh, so I'm did. interested in the energy, to, you know, yeah. creating energy out of water. You were down in uh, LA for or Caltech for that? No, I was here, but I, Yan Yi, but I helped him in oh. that competition. Oh. Yeah. Um, all right, let's step back for a second. I got to give a talk like this to the alums, you know? Uh, we touched on a lot of things here. And one of them is like energy positive treatment. How does that really work? Well, I don't think I can put up a bunch of slides with some ammonia going to nitrous oxide, putting that down in a combustor and, no? I try to want to communicate that. Visually, have an idea of what kind of force. Yeah, maybe I can go back to that and say capture yeah. ammonia is nice. That was the uh, when we looked at. Yeah, this is like uh, you know how do we deal with the nitrogen problem in the bay? Another one is is if you go to a complete anaerobic system for this energy recovery of the carbon, you know, with a whole lot of ammonia, and there are ways, and this is what we've researched here at Stanford is to take that ammonia and make it, make it to nitrous oxide. And you can blend that in with the methane and you get an energy boost. It acts as a, uh, as a you know, it takes the place of oxygen in the combustion process. Yes? Last year you hit more on those chemical pathways and I, yeah, it seems like you've got time. That, that is a fascinating thing to add. Yeah, okay, um, I can put that in there. I'll, I'll say you have, there are different ways to, uh, address this. So maybe I can say, um, yeah. And also say tying in with climate change a little bit more, especially for this class are interested, you know, what, are, what can you say about um, cities, coastal communities worrying about rising sea levels, about more severe storms, about variability of when it's going to rain or when it isn't, so dealing with floods and droughts with much more frequency, things like that are just of, of keen interest, right? And really important. Well, that's exactly the problem we have, uh, is the variability in our water. Uh, and, you know, we have wet years and dry years. So with, more, with greater decentralization and more reuse, you're kind of bulletproofing yourself against that, right? Right. Uh, there, I guess there are lots of ways to think about it, but uh, you want to think about the resiliency of your system. And Water reuse is a good assured water supply. Uh, Stormwater capture is uh, making use of water that's currently available, but we're not using it. So those things have, you know, think, oh gosh, we should be doing that to a larger and larger degree. And that means we're less dependent on the water imports. And the water imports are hugely affected by climate change. And that's water from the Sierra Nevadas, the snowmelt, or from the Colorado River. So the future here is uh, there's a lot of challenges about how we manage those systems. And historically, it's been the tension between agriculture and cities. Who gets the water? But there's a third claimant now. Uh, I was in school when the Clean uh, uh, Water Act was passed. And basically, it said you couldn't kill the fish, you know, with, with your wastes. But there was nothing in that act that said you couldn't take all their water. You know? <laughs> That's, yeah. Now we realize we can't take all the water. So we need to provide more water for ecosystem services. In other words, the San Joaquin needs to flow. 
And right now, it's, you know, the water, you have these diversions, and there are places where it doesn't flow in the summer. Another example is the Carmel River, where they would put so much of that, uh, those groundwater wells were pumped to such an extent that in the summer, the Carmel River would go dry. And then there were, this was, it's the peculiarity of uh, California law that groundwater uh, is not managed, except in certain situations. But surface water is. Surface water, that's what you can go out and see. That's managed and highly regulated. Groundwater, it all depends on where you are. So what happened there is that the pumping of the groundwater in Carmel depleted the Carmel River. So Carmel's water supply, this, you know, this is California American water. They said, you got to stop pumping your wells because you're impacting the surface water here. And they could show the direct connection between the two. And, and for them then, now they're looking at lots of alternatives. What do you do in Monterey and Pacific Grove? And again, it's, a, it's, it's not going to be one answer. It's a combination of more recycle. It's a combination of cities working together, of um, the stormwater capture, and the desal facility. And the desal will go, um, I think it's called Sand City. You know, that's, isn't that the place just north of, uh, along the coast there? But there isn't, a, there isn't you know, one solution. It's how do these different pieces work and fit together? I guess I could throw in the Carmel River one. I find that fascinating, you know. Yeah. Oh, well, one last thing about, about Carmel and the whole Salinas Valley. When they put in the state water project, uh, they didn't want to be a part of it. You all know where 152 is. You go over Pacheco Pass, you know, and you get there and you see the San Luis Reservoir. That's diverted water from the state water project. It's storage. We're tied into that. They built a little pipeline to take that water and put it in the Anderson Reservoir south of San Jose. Monterey, when they were, when they were building that pipeline, Monterey had the opportunity to say, well, do you want us just to take a little extension and pull it over to you guys? They said, no. Now, we're going back to when I was in high school, OK? Why did they say no? It's the same reason that Marin says no to lots of things about water. Because they, don't want, they didn't want urban development. More water would mean more development. And they didn't want that. Or there was a fear that one would lead to the other. So it's really interesting when you look at the Salinas Valley and Monterey as a piece of the state. They're really on their own. You have all this massive plumbing that can move water all over the state except right in there. And I don't know, to me, that Salinas Valley, Carmel, Monterey, Sand City, they're kind of a, like a little microcosm for the whole state, in a way. They're throwing the Carmel River instead of the San Joaquin or Sacramento. All right. So it sounded like the motivation for a distributed treatment network was largely the energy cost of pumping it over further distances. It's the energy cost and the um, reverse plumbing system that's needed. So, so, I mean, it sounds like we already have a, a reasonable network set up for distribution based on the more centralized um, treatment. Um, um, so, I guess my question is, has, the, has there been a consideration or a study of what the the costs are from a financial standpoint and a carbon emission standpoint of building all of these new decentralized treatments versus just installing, you know, clean energy sources to push the water around through the network that we currently have because it seems like then you could have a more decentralized storage network that would be a lot less financially and um, energetically intensive process to set up. So. So I mean, part of like dump trucks and all the stuff that you need is still going to burn a lot of carbon and yeah. can cost a lot of money to put in. No, that's place. part of the uh, analysis that you do on this. And when you look at these decentralized systems, you could put um, different categories here: carbon emissions, capital costs, operating costs, public acceptance, and 
you have to step back then and say, what does the community want? What would be value to them and what would work? But so there isn't just one simple answer to your, to your question, but it does come down to this trying to weigh one alternative versus another. And what's, what's politically feasible? What, so I used the Stanford campus as an example. We're quirky here in the water reuse sense. Why are we quirky? We have two water distribution systems on campus, right where we sit now. There are two water distributions. One of them is the water we drink. It's the water that comes from the Hetch Hetchy system from the Yosemite National Park. Then there's another system that's lake water from Felt Lake. That comes over here and it's used for irrigation all around. Everything inside the campus drive loop is on a, its own irrigation system with lake water. So imagine we take all of our wastewater, a million gallons a day, build this little treatment system over here, reclaim easily half that water, and put it into that irrigation system. Now we don't have to use Hetch Hetchy water. So, but we're using that for irrigation. We're using this reclaimed water for irrigation, and we just happen to have a separate distribution network. So why would Stanford want to invest a few million dollars in this treatment facility? It's, well, it's say, well, how are we going to meet our water supply needs in the future? If we get in drought, your water gets cut back, we're, going to, we're not going to get any more water from the Hetch Hetchy system ever. It's tapped out. So our future is like we need to sort of have drought-proof water for the Stanford campus. And one way to, that seems pretty logical here is to think about taking advantage of the second distribution system. And the other one would be I live on campus is you know, extending that over to our neighborhood. They, they used to do it a long time ago. In fact, I have a, a spigot in my backyard where it used to come, but they cut that pipe. So I answered your question by an example. And it's uh, this, uh, this idea of the satellite treatment plant is very attractive for the Stanford campus. And the, oh, the other thing is it has low salt content too. When you get down near the bay, it, it, let's say we did do the centralized treatment and then you put this big purple pipe up Embarcadero Avenue to the Stanford campus. What you'll find over time is because of the kind of plants we've put here, like redwoods, uh, the water's too salty for long-term irrigation with that. So it's the combination of the purple pipe, the energy backwards, and the higher salt. Question on indirect potable reuse and recycled water. Um, are you are you talking about like gray water systems, or is this like sewage that you're talking about recycling? Well, a lot of what we're talking about here are, are um, larger systems that would be um, of some scale. Now, gray water, when you you know that's sort of like shower water and that kind of thing, uh, wash water. Um, that's popular at the scale of maybe a home. Uh, and part of this idea of thinking about decentralized systems is how decentralized do you want to go? And uh, uh, gray water reuse is something that is attractive with the public. Um, it needs to be done safely and, uh, you know, and, and the like, but it's something that's allowed. Um, Maybe in terms of decentralized systems, you'd probably look more at you know, new apartment buildings or a big office complex or something like that. Or maybe you look at, say, the new, you know, that new Google, not Google, um, Apple. You know, the Apple headquarters that looks like a great big spaceship. Well, there's going to be a lot of water there. So you say, well, that, that's a place where you could take all kinds of gray water and do something with it. Or the same thing over with the, the Google campus in Mountain View. So it's done, and there are a lot of, you know, it's done, and there are ways you can, you can do this and replumb your house. Uh, so it's at the scale of a home. I and some other folks, you know, always sort of worry a little bit about the public health consequences of it. If you, the people that do it now, I think, are, you know, real conscious of what, of what they're doing. Uh, but if you said everyone's going to do this, then all you have to have is some contamination in that water, and maybe you need to say, well, I should be concerned about pathogens. It's not chemicals. It's, it'd be the pathogens. Yeah? I noticed that in an earlier 
earlier slide you had a UV treatment, uh, I, I guess instead of chemical treatment to get rid of pathogens. Is, can you say something about is that growing and what in what uh, situations is that most appropriate? Well, why, why the UV treatment? Uh, there are a few compounds uh, that are low molecular weight and like to be in water. And, and they're non-ionic. And they can pass through those RO membranes. And so the UV treatment is basically zaps those compounds. That's, that's it. And also it's, it's, a, it's a secondary disinfection system. But it, mainly it's there because it takes care of the residu any, any chemicals that would pass the RO membrane, any organic chemicals will be destroyed by the UV light. All right. Okay.